intelligence. He may have faked his own death in a plane crash that he might have blown yeah. up and then he changed his identity and walked off like uh, somebody else. Is that what you just said? That's, that's what people have said. That's the other crazy. thing is, yeah, but you got to remember this. I love that. Electric, Electric Ladyland Studios was the studios Hendrix recorded in. That was the studio that Mike Jeffries had borrowed the money from the Bob to build. He had to pay it back. He didn't have the money. So that was one reason that it would be, Hendrix would be a good sacrifice. If Hendrix was leaving Jeffrey for a new manager, Jeffrey would get nothing. Wow. And so, I mean, that's, that's the legend. That's the story. I mean, Lisa? wow. Zeta, what do you think of that? Is that I, like the most whacked out thing? I mean, yeah. it's fascinating, isn't it's it? Fascinating. I mean, truly. But, you know, I, I, I guess in that era, in that time frame, Nothing surprises me because so many of these things that just nothing was straightforward back then. Everybody had an angle. I mean, they do now, but I think they were able to get away with more back then than they would today. Well, I mean, you got, I mean, one that jumps out as similar sort of energetically, of course, is Marilyn Monroe, right? Nobody knows what happened to Marilyn Monroe. Was she killed by Bobby Kennedy? I mean, I mean, this, the list of possibilities goes on and on and on. But this is super fascinating. Dear God, this is super fascinating. Now, so have you, have you already written, are you going to write a book about this? this I mean, uh, I may put a... I may put a chapter in it, but there's certain things I want to go back over. Now, like I told you, there are a lot of people who are close to Hendrix. They've all got stories. And, you know, you've got to ascertain which part is true. And you've got to, you've got to go through it, like the Jeffrey thing. I mean, I've heard that. But uh, a lot of people in the knew that Jimmy was terrified of Mike Jeffrey. And uh, that Jeffrey had let it be known that he could reach out and get him any time he wanted. So, you know. This would be something to consider. But, I mean, all this stuff, I mean, with Hendrix's death, the main thing is your toxicology report. That doesn't make sense. Bobby Fuller doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, so there's some things that are definitely needing more, a little, little bit more investigation. But uh, it's a great storyline. And it's what rock and roll myths and legends are. I mean, what's the difference between a myth and a legend? Well, you know, somebody says, well, you know, I heard Jeffrey's plane. He blew it up. Well, that's, that could be the great myth because no body was ever discovered. But then it becomes a legend in the idea of what happened with Hendrix's death and murder. And that's what keeps it going. That's what, and that's what makes it interesting. I like their music. This is what lasts forever. And when you look at, like, Bobby Fuller or other, or other sort of unusual forensic reports, then that gets into speculation about the complicity of the police or, you know, the DA or any number of things, you know, then you start going, who owns who? I mean, it, it makes just layers and layers and layers. So this true, cr true crime kind of thing is just fascinating. Are there others? You know, I'm not going to let you up. Okay. Are there others like this that have a similar kind of thing that, that people may not like me, <laughs> may not know. I mean, Gary, yeah, there's, there's got to be more of these. So, I mean, this isn't wild. I mean, totally. I, I'm now, I feel like I'm Scott here now. Like, oh my God, I know, I know I'm talking. <laughs> so, um, any others, I, I'm going to go to Sam Cook. All right. The Sam Cook is kind of a, a unique situation here. What's, so for people who don't know who, that don't know who the heck Sam Cook was, do you want to kind of fill in a little background of who he was? And you know, they may have heard his music in some films recently, you know. But give us some background about Sam Cook, and then talk about what may have happened to him. Well, you know, Sam Cook was probably one of the greatest R&B singers of the late fifties, early sixties. He. Uh, did Cupid, you might have heard that song, and What a Wonderful World It'll Be. And 
Uh, I know that, and of course, Bring It All Home to Me is one of my favorite ones for Sam Cooke. But Otis Redding loves Sam Cooke, too. And if you'll notice his albums, he always tried to have a song for Sam Cooke on his albums because he was he was just fabulous. He was an incredible singer. He started in gospel music and then left the gospel choirs and the gospel recordings and went into secular music, as you'd say. And then a strange thing happened when he was killed was that he picked up some girl, gone to a motel. She had taken his clothes, ran away. He, he had an overcoat and came chasing her into the manager's office. And the manager shot him and beat him to death with a club or the baseball bat. And, uh, you know, that was just very out of the ordinary for Sam Cooke. So, you know, that was a death that people say, you know, that just doesn't sound right. That just doesn't sound like Sam Cooke and, uh, you know, how he was, uh, how he was killed. But, you know, to me, I don't have a problem with, you know, the investigation of that because, I mean, it's like Shakespeare says, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is often teared with their bones. So it's the same thing in rock and roll or lit, whatever. But, uh, you know, just the idea of Sam Cooke, you know, the, the great gospel singer. And uh, there's been a number of books written, and there have been some suggestions that uh, Sam Cooke's wife married Bobby Womack about two weeks after the funeral, and people thought, well, that doesn't look too nice. But who knows? You know, that's just one of the great stories. And, of course, you know, one of the greatest songs when I think about Sam Cooke is The Change Is Gonna Come, because that became the song that defined the whole civil rights movement, too. So we don't want to just put him away as a great R&B singer. Uh, Change is going to come became one of the main songs that actually led to the civil rights movement. So, and actually led to the progress. So we don't want to forget that end of it. But you know, you just got incredibly talented people, and people have their own demons, and people have their own accidents, and whether it's some form of coincidence or whatever, or when murder plays a role. I mean, there's always the answer. You always follow the money, right? And that's how you come up with the answer. Well, one of the recent ones, and you start talking about gospel singers and and famous, you know, sort of popular singers, that I'm kind of curious about is Whitney Houston. So I want, are there any stories? Because I think that situation is kind of funky to me. It doesn't, it didn't clang my bell as all the, everything makes sense to me. Have you well, heard anything about Whitney Houston's death that's maybe a little suspect? Well, I mean, there's there's stories that uh, some drug involvement with some people who were involved in the drugs, that uh, some of the purchases that they had got her. Uh, I mean, you hear that. I mean, when Michael Jackson dies, anytime a celebrity dies, you go through a pattern. And the pattern, I mean, it can be Sam Cooke or Whitney Houston. They'll all follow the same end until you get to the point. And the thing is, you know, you go through these these ideas of some conspiracy theory, uh, rumors of uh, organized crime link, whether that there was money owed or whether the person was uh, working for a label that may be under organized crime. And if you take a look at that, I mean, my gosh, in the early 60s, a lot of record companies are owned by organized crime. You know, I mean, you take a look at Lieber and Stoller, and they were talking about how they sold their record label, Redbird Record, for $1 just to get out of it because a lot of gangsters had moved into their label. So, I mean, you're going to have that happening. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, when I look at something and somebody's body's found and they've got gasoline in their stomach and they say they committed suicide, I mean, I know that's not true. But, you know, and, and some of the others, you just have to explore it out with forensic evidence. And you talk to the people who know, people who were their friends, people who were there. And that's what I try to do. I always talk to someone who was close to them. So so that's kind of the, the this-worldly mystery. I want to shift gears. We got about, well, we still got 20 minutes. We can have 15 stories in the next 20 minutes. We've got about 20 minutes left. I want to go to the otherworldly version of rock. Because you got those stories, too. Are there any that pop in your head that seem even wackier on on the wacky scale of stuff that's running around in your mind? Are there any that jump out to you as things that would entertain me? How's that for 
Do you have any yeah. stories that I would like that I haven't heard? How's that for her? That's an interview question you never heard before. Anything well, I'd I mean, like I, that you haven't told me already? Well, I don't know if I told you about it. I'll tell you about Joe Meek, who was a record producer in England, who uh, was a big Buddy Holly fan. and He was playing tarot cards one day, and it was 1958. And it says, Buddy Holly dies February 3rd. So it freaked him out. So when the crickets came over, he tried to get in touch with Buddy Holly before then. But the crickets came to England in March 58, and he, he goes up to Buddy Holly and he says, listen, you're going to have to promise me you're going to be careful on February the 3rd because I got a message that you're going to die. Well, February 3rd, 1959, Buddy Holly died in a plane crash. On February 3rd, 1967, Joe Meek, the man who not only was contacting uh, Buddy Holly in the afterlife, getting his reviews of his records, and other rock stars like Eddie Cochran, uh, kills his landlady and kills himself with a shotgun on February 3rd, 67, on the anniversary of the Buddy Holly plane crash. And the only other great record producer of that time period was Phil Spector. I was in L.A. flying out, and I noticed in a newspaper on February 3rd that, that uh, Phil Spector had been arrested for murder. And that ended his career on February 3rd. So sometimes you can go into the beyond. And that would be one story that I think is interesting about how a record producer and a songwriter started contacting the seances, rock stars, for hit songs. So you might find that interesting. I do. I do. You know, I was actually, many years ago, was approached by a group of people. You'll find this story entertaining. I'll tell you quickly. I was approached when I was in my 30s to give financial seminars to channel like J.P. Morgan and Andrew Carnegie. <laughs> this is true. You know, I didn't do it. I said, well, that just seems weird to me. But no, some people wanted to have me basically channel like J.P. Morgan and... Um, Andrew Carnegie or whoever, whoever they had in their list. I know J.P. Morgan was one of them. And give financial advice and do seminars. So there you go. Um, I also used to be involved with a magazine, a radio show for um, a music magazine that I'm not going to give their name, but the guy was born on February 3rd. 1961, as my girlfriend, who knew Brian Adams when he was starting out in Vancouver, was also born on February 3rd, and, you know, I've said many times that I believe that Brian Adams is, in fact, the reincarnation of Buddy Holly, and he was born nine months almost to the day, he was born November 5th, 1959, so, um, so there's a lot of February 3rd, and that man is married to the daughter of a very famous, super famous rock star from that period. So, you know, it's, um, so there's all sorts of February 3rd connections. Um, any ghost stories you have that jump, you know, off the top of your head with, with musicians that you've heard? You gotta, you gotta have a few. <laughs> you know, I'm not too sure how many uh, rock stars lead ghosts. I know that you know people would claim to see Jim Morrison's ghost. I had a friend in Nashville. My attorney has a realtor who purchased a condo that had shag carpet not only on the floors but on the walls, and it had a stage in one of the bedrooms for a band to perform. And uh, they had, start, had steel bars in the window so nobody could break in. And she kept seeing a spirit in the condo. And it was a very young Elvis Presley. So she actually had to have someone come over to tell Elvis it was all right to pass over. She said he looked just like he did in uh, some of the early movies, like in the early 50s, and that uh, she did verify that Elvis did own that condominium, and that's where they would perform when he was in Nashville. They would wow. rehearse. So there was an Elvis sighting. I heard that one. That's that's one ghost story. Wow, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I like that one. Um, 
I, I want to sh shift gears.